Dear audience, I am Radosław Parma, an international cardiologist from Katowice, Poland, and it is my great privilege to welcome you to this passionate and very up-to-date webinar on TAVI in bicuspid aortic valve patients, with a SAPIN3 platform being a safe and efficient option. The learning objectives of the current uh, webinar are to explain which bicuspid aortic valve patients can benefit from TAVI, also about the current clinical evidence of using SAPIN3 in this specific patient anatomies, and the important aspect of sizing and positioning the SAPIN3 to achieve optimal outcomes. I have the honor to be here together with you and the faculty, with Dr. Daniel Blackman from the Leeds Teaching Hospital in the UK, from Professor Jörg Kempfert, the cardiac surgeon from the German Heart Center in Berlin, Germany, uh, and also with Professor Bruno Garcia, an interventional cardiologist working in Barcelona in Spain. So now this is the program of our session. Uh, we will start with a Professor Kempfert presentation on which patients are indicated for TAVI today. So Professor Kempfert, please share your knowledge and experience with us. Thank you, Radoslav. Also welcome from my side. So the topic is which patients are indicated for TAVI as you know it of today. So as you are most likely aware of, a bicuspid aortic valve uh, is a prevalence, has a prevalence of one to 2% in the worldwide population. And we do expect that one out of three will develop uh, indication uh, to have an intervention on this valve once it degenerates. So it is also a well-known fact that these bicuspid interventions typically occur when patients are still young. So the majority of patients will be 70 or even younger when they require a treatment. And this is why it's no surprise that currently the rate of bicuspid patients being treated with TAVI is still limited. On the other hand, we have good insight from the recently published uh, TBT registry and this is a kind of subgroup of patients. This is focusing on the Sapien 3 platform only. And this is comparing bicuspid versus tricuspid anatomy. And this is done by propensity score matching. And if you have a look at the overall mortality, you can see this is quite good outcome. There's no difference, tricuspid versus bicuspid. But if you have a closer look on the details, you will see that there is a significant increase in conversion to surgery, as well as a slight increase in the occurrence of relevant paravalvular leaks. So in other words, there also the overall results are excellent. There seem to be a couple of patients that either experience a root rupture or a relevant paravalvular leak. So to better understand this phenomenon, uh, I would try, like to draw your attention to this excellent publication of last year in Jack from you and all. And what they did is they have classified the patient in three different anatomical groups. And you clearly can see that the red patients are uh, those that don't do very well. So this, in this case, the patients you will see uh, excess in mortality up to two years, which is most likely based on uh, root rupture as well as paravalvular leak. And if you have a closer look, those red patients are those that have either excessive leaflet, leaflet calcification or an excessive calcified rafe. So those patients seem to be very challenging for TAVI anatomy. So if you have a brief look on the current guidelines, we uh, need to understand that Bicuspid valve uh, uh, anatomy is often, often associated with the dilated ascending aorta. And this is uh, the case if the dilated uh, ascending is uh, exceeding five centimeter in total diameter, then there is a generally accepted indication to have surgery and to replace the ascending. And other than that, the current guidelines don't mention uh, TAVI uh, uh, that much uh, as of today. This is simply because of the fact that we lack randomized low risk trials. But still, I think it's a kind of a daily routine that some patient might still be good candidate uh, for a TAVI procedure. And this is why the expert uh, panel has come up with some help to, uh, for the local heart teams in their everyday work to guide uh, the potential decision. And I would like to talk to you briefly through this decision-making algorithm. So the first gateway would be whether or not there is an indication to replace the ascending aor aorta. And if this is the case, then obviously the route is uh, bound for surgery. If this is not the case, so no significant dilatation, then the question is uh, the age. So if you like to focus uh, at first at the young patients, so 65 or less, 
in those patients, the majority should undergo surgery, potentially even with a mechanical valve replacement. On the other hand, and the other extreme, those who are age 80 or older, if the anatomy is somehow feasible for TAVI, then I guess most heart teams will agree that this, despite its lack in, pro, uh, in uh, prospective randomized data, a TAVI is a very good alternative to surgery in these elderly patients. On the other hand, if the valve anatomy is not favorable, surgery still can be discussed. Now let's focus on the middle group, and this is those that are middle age, so 65 to 80. And they're obviously uh, the decision-making factor that is of utmost importance in bicuspid valve anatomy is whether or not these uh, patients are favorable in regard to their anatomy. And if they're not favorable, then uh, the decision-making is very easy. The route to go is surgery. But if they have a favorable uh, anatomy for TAVI, then it's the uh, responsibility of the local heart team to guide the patients uh, in the direction of the uh, best treatment option. And in our opinion, this is in low-risk patients, still surgical valve replacement. In the intermediate risk, we need to have a, a thorough discussion within the team and with the patient uh, to decide whether to go for TAVI or surgical AVR. And obviously in the high or extreme risk cohort, TAVI is the uh, preferred option. So in summary, by cuspid aortic valve, um, uh, the cuspid aortic valve anatomy is most commonly seen uh, in the younger patients. As we lack randomized trials for low risk patient in the bicuspid group, the guidelines still do not reflect the indication. And this is why they advise most commonly surgery. However, TAVI may still be a very good alternative in selected patients after a thorough heart team discussion. And in this discussion, we should focus not only on age, but most importantly on anatomy and the calcification pattern, in addition to the surgical risk factors in order to guide uh, the optimal uh, decision-making. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for sharing uh, all this information. I would like to uh, now turn your attention to the clinical experience using Sapien in bicuspid aortic valves. And I'm going to show you what we all witnessed in our centers, uh, even from the early experience in TAVI in bicuspid patients. So what you can see is that we, in 2010, uh, we witnessed uh, patients with inoperable and high risk who were qualified for TAVI using the first uh, Sapien generation of the device and leading to a relatively high mortality rates and also 27.3 paravarial leak uh, rates. So what, what I think is that uh, through 2015 and 2016, as you can see in the papers listed below, is that we we learned how to reduce the rate of para paravival leaks, how to select this, these patients, and most importantly, we engaged CT as a default option to screen all our patients uh, who are discussed by heart teams for bicuspid valve treatment. And by doing this, and also we witnessed a change and improvements in the next generation of Sapien device, we we witnessed the reduction of paravavular leaks, and also we were trying to reduce the rate of pacemaker implantation uh. by putting the valve higher. So um, what is, this is the paper this, uh, which, um, which on a later stage in 2017, tried to match the bicuspid uh, population of patients with tricuspid ones. And this was in the era of uh, the default CT uh, use for the definition of the best uh, patients to qualify to TAVI. And here you can see the outcomes. When the CT was a default measure for patient recruitment, and also the heart team was experienced also with a Sapien 3 device, uh, the, the outcome, the 30-day outcome between these two populations was comparable. The 30-day mortality, uh, although it was slightly higher at 1.9%, the uh, paravavial leak rate was 0%. Uh, the device success was comparable. And also the pacemaker rate, although a bit higher, it was similar between bicuspid patients and patients with tricuspid anatomy. 
So here you can see the retrospective analysis from the largest uh, registry, which summarized the experience of uh, uh, the use of Sapien 3 device in bicuspid anatomy. And you can see that in, in this uh, population with the STS score of 4.9%, where echocardiography and preprocedural CT was mandatory in all patients, the, the outcomes between bicuspid anatomy and tricuspid anatomy was comparable on 30-day follow-up and also on one-year follow-up. And you can also see that this gives us the, the information that the introduction of the CT scan uh, witnessed by the improvement of the, on the device and also the improvement of how heart teams work and how we recruit and select precise patients for bicuspid, with, for bicuspid treatment uh, gives comparable outcomes uh, for both of these populations. This also is confirmed in the Parton 3 trial, a trial with a very strict recruitment and screening of the patients. This bicuspid nested registry of 71 patients with a mean STS 1.4, so very low risk patients, gave the information that if we screen these patients thoroughly and recruit a very specific population, the primary endpoint shows that no deaths occurred at 30 days follow-up and one death occurred at one year follow-up with two non-disabled strokes at one year. So you can see also that other complications were zero uh, for both the registry and the continuous access registry. And there was no need for a second valve and no valve embolization in this population. This, uh, these are other secondary endpoints, which also, also show that the experience we gained together with the uh, with a Im improvements of the system and the proper seeding gives very good results uh, in, for patients we are currently selecting. Also, you can see that the same or lower pacemaker rate uh, we can achieve in this population uh, com in comparison to the real world TVT registry da data. So I would like to uh, I would like to show you that uh, these reduced complications with Sapien 3 procedures may also be achieved in highly calcified anatomies, but we, we have to be aware how to classify them. Uh, on the left panel, you have the classification, uh, which assesses the classification of the aortic anatomy and also the classification of the RAFI. So in patients with a calcification of the fully calcified anatomy and a calcified RAFI, these are the patients who may experience uh, the complications mostly. But as you can see, the rates of the, rates of the complication on say with Sapien 3 are much lower and significantly lower than with self-expandable devices, which are shown on the right. And also yeah, what we can take from this slide is that if only the anatomy is more uh, safe, is safer for these patients with bicuspid anatomies, that means without these two uh, risk scores. So either the RAFI is not calcified so much or the, the calcium burden is not so significant, we can safely treat this pa these patients with Sapien 3. Whereas with the self-expandable devices, the, especially the rate of paravavial leaks may be significantly higher leading to worse outcomes. And these outcomes do matter because what you can see here is that the predictors of mortality after TAVI at one year uh, are two most important, is the rate of paravavial leaks and also the rate of maze-maker implantations. And both these measures, and especially the paravavial leak rate, was significantly reduced during the last 10 years of our treatment of bicuspid patients in our centers. So we can see that it is even more relevant because the bicuspid patients population is usually younger than the tricuspid being currently treated and the lack of paravavial leak and also the lack of pacemaker implantation is very important uh, for the outlook in the future. So this, I would like to give it as a last slide because here you can also, uh, also see the rate, and this is 
quite evident from our everyday practice that the rate of pre-dilatation and post-dilatation in patients with bicuspid anatomies is much lower for the Sapien 3 than for self-expandable devices. And uh, in our center in Katowice, we are even less than the stated 18% by Professor Cieche. Uh, we pre-dilate even less often than, than 18%. And we do very little uh, post dilatation, less than 15% of post dilatation, because we witness no paravavial leaks uh, in these anatomies. If the patients are scrutinized very well with a CT and the proper population is selected for bicuspid valve treatment. So, in summary, I would like to state that the TAVI uh, in all our centers have evolved and uh, have evolved to be paralleled by the CT scan uh, for each patient, and we should scrutinize the patient and select a very specific bicuspid population for TAVI treatment. And if the heart team selects the, this, these patients, follow it, the, the heart team may expect, expect the outcomes which have been already evidenced by the PARTNER3 uh, low-risk trial, and also uh, the data which I showed from the largest uh, registry, the TVT registry. Thank you very much. Thanks, Radislav. Uh, apologies to everyone for joining you late. As you can see by my uh, red face and uh, surgical gear, I got stuck with an emergency case. Um, I've had a chance, luckily, to see that to, to, to look at both Jurg's and um, Radislav's talks and um, which were excellent coverage of those kind of key basic underlying principles of which patients we should be considering for TAVI in 2021 with bicuspid anatomy and the evidence base for the Sapien 3 valve. So we've got thankfully a good 10 minutes of discussion. I think the questions might be coming through to Radislav rather than me because I was late, but maybe I can open it up with a key question for Jörg, which is, do we need a randomized controlled trial of TAVI versus surgery in bicuspid anatomy? And if so, how would you design that trial? Yeah, obviously this is the key question. So the main reason uh, that the uh, current guidelines are not supporting the use of TAVI uh, more liberally in the low risk population, I'm talking uh, uh, for low risk patients here, is because we don't have these randomized trials. So as we have been mentioned, Bicuspid patients typically are at younger age. So having an endpoint in one or two year might be not appropriate for those patients because what we have not discussed yet uh, is the potential stand under expansion in patients that might have a heavily, heavily calcified landing zone. And these potentially deformed stents might also have a significant impact in the durability of these valves. So I guess, uh, yes, to impact guidelines, we would need to have a randomized trial. Um, uh, on the other hand, as long as we don't have such trial data, I think it is critical to select those patients that have a favorable landing zone, because in those, I don't believe that we see any different to tricuspid, but there are those patients with excessive calcification that better should not be treated with TAVI if they are low risk. Yeah, I mean, you actually already answered my second question, which was durability, because I think that is a key concern for me in treating bicuspid patients. We do more often see eccentric frame under expansion, um, maybe less so with sapien, and that may be an advantage because we too it tends to become more circular. But we've got to believe that that may impact on durability. Radislav, I mean, you talked about the role of sapien three broadly in the evidence base. How do you factor in the specific anatomy, you know, the kind of issues that Jörg alluded to there in, in, in determining which patients are suitable for, for a Sapien 3 valve? So I think that the diagram which Professor Kampert presented is uh, very good to follow in, uh, um, in specifying which patient may actually undergo SAVR best and which may be selected to TAVI. I think that the first question uh, is focused on the uh, dilatation of the ascending aorta. And I think uh, what we are also here discussing about the lack of evidence, I think we have still the lack of evidence if the TAVI may uh, prevent from further dilatation of the ascending aorta. So if we see uh, a patient who may be operated with a ascending uh, aorta above 
uh, 50 millimeters, we we strictly advise, uh, if only it is possible, uh, to operate on this patient. And then, if the patient uh, still is of the higher risk of the surgery, we tend to select patients uh, which, as you said, do not have severe calcification of the aortic annulus, because we want to first um, we want to first expand the valve so that no paravalvular leaks are present. Second, we want to avoid any aortic root rupture and avoid, in, especially in young patients, we want to avoid the pacemakers. So I think if the anatomy is in the middle the grade of the cal calcification, the RAFI is not very severely calcified, and also there is no RBBB, which means that uh, there is no increased uh, risk of uh, pacemaker implantation, uh, we are quite positive of selecting these patients for sapien 3 implantation uh, with, and it is true, uh, we observe very low risk or very low rate of paravavial leaks. What about different types of bicuspid on the SEVAS classification? Um, Bruno, do you, how do you approach type zero and type two? Obviously type one we see most commonly and we're most comfortable treating that with TAVI. Do we need to treat type zero and type two as different animals? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Blackman, to ask me about that. Uh, yeah, I think that the most common uh, bicuspid patient that we will face with uh, with uh, sapien three will be the type one, especially the the one who is uh, the ray phase between left and right uh, coronary cusps. But uh, we should avoid type zero. And also we should, let's say not avoid, but let's be, be aware that type two, it's not, uh, it's not a good option. Uh, not, not only with uh, Sapien 3, but whatever TAVI system we work. But uh, yeah, yeah, of course we, we will focus on type one, but uh, obviously there are some inoperable patients that we should uh, give an option. And all of us, we have some cases of type zero or type two with uh, some impressive results. Uh, but um, as you were commenting, there are no still evidence of uh, randomized trials between bicuspid patients between surgery and, and uh, TAVI. And especially if there are extreme anatomies, then we should avoid them on the, let's say on the, on the regular practice. Yeah, I think with type two, we just don't really have anything to go by. As you say, we we believe from the nature of type two bicuspids that it's that TAVI is not going to be a good treatment option, and they're also very rare. So 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 we, we can't really be in a position to treat those except in inoperable cases. Radislav, are you fielding questions from our audience? Yes, I would like to ask you. There's a question uh, to ask you a question on how many months. Uh, should the patient, uh, how many months the patients after TAVI in tricuspid or bicuspid anatomy uh, need to go back to their normal life? Is there any difference between these populations? How do you see the, these patients improving in their daily practice? I, well, I mean, if that's questions to me, I, I, I don't think there's any difference. Um, I must say, I think it the, the recovery of the patient is determined by factors other than um, whether it's bicuspid or tricuspid. It's principally around the pre-morbid functional capacity of the patient, the frailty or other wise of the patient. There's some nice data from the UK TAVI trial, actually, on quality of life. They looked at quality of life at quite a few more time points than um, the other randomized trials of TAVI versus surgery including two weeks after the procedure and showed that even at two weeks post TAVI, the quality of life in the TAVI arm was substantially better than the baseline quality of life. Um, whereas with the surgical aortic valve replacement, as you might expect, the quality of life at two weeks was actually worse than the baseline quality of life. Um, and then we saw a similar pattern to the other trials where surgery was back to baseline um, by three months and six months and 12 months. Um, there was a, still a small advantage for TAVI in the UK TAVI trial. So I think that, you know, we all, as we all know, that's one of the huge advantages of TAVI. The recovery is extremely rapid and um, 
And I don't think that's any different for bicuspid anatomy. And so the, the last question which appeared, do you think that severe left ventricular hypertrophy influences the choice of the treatment of, of bicuspid anatomy, whether it should be TAVI or surgery? Um, well, I was just, do, if, for me to answer that one, no, I think is a simple answer. I mean, I think we know left ventricular hypertrophy is one of the indicators of you know adv more advanced disease. Um, but I don't believe we have any data that clearly indicates um, a more favorable outcome in the context of LVH for surgery or TAVI. I mean, there are quite a few nice echo and MRI studies looking at um, remodeling with TAVI and surgery. And certainly remodeling with TAVI is, is, is at least equally favorable after correction of the aortic stenosis. But, uh, but from, my, from my perspective, that wouldn't influence the decision-making process. I think I'd go along with what Radislav was saying to my question, that the nice thing about the work that Raj Makar and his group at Cedar sinai did in, in distinguishing uh, bicuspids according to the degree of calcification of the RAFI and the cusp was that it did show really quite significant differences in procedural and even um, hard clinical outcomes, including mortality. So that's given us a clear steer as to what factors are unfavorable for TAVI. Um, and that was principally with the Sapien 3 valve. And, and that is severe calcification of the cusps and calcification of the RAFI. And in particular, when both were present, as, you, as you've both shown, you know, as you've shown in your presentation. So I think it's the anatomy uh, is a much more important uh, factor in in influencing the decision between surgery and TAVI. Radislav, do we have any more questions? If not, we could perhaps move on to the next phase of the session, which is our case presentations. Please do. So we've got three great case presentations we're gonna have now, uh, and they're gonna really tell us about how to optimally treat bicuspid anatomy, particularly sizing and positioning, but also general procedural technique with three uh, challenging but slightly different cases. Um, and I think the first case we're going to have is from Jörg, um, Jörg Kempfert from the German Heart Centre in Berlin. So Jörg, I'll hand over to you and let you take over the slide presentation and we'll enjoy to looking forward to seeing your presentation. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so the idea is to uh, share with you a couple of cases. It's my privilege to share with you a recent type zero bicuspid. Um, so if we can move to the slides, here we go. So it was a 70 year old male patient in the intermediate risk uh, profile, logistic Europe of score 15, status past the uh, STEMI with a recent PCI still a dual platelet. And within the heart team, this uh, kind of was the decision-making uh, in the direction of Tavi because he's still a dual platelet and he also has a malignant carcinoma requiring urgent treatment. Otherwise, and as a surgeon, I need to mention this, uh, a 70 year old male with an SDS of less than 1% is also a very good candidate for surgery. But if he requires urgent treatment for a malignant carcinoma, then obviously this is in the direction of a TAVI procedure. Now let's have a look. This is the coronaries after PCI. There are no residual uh, lesions left, so there's nothing to worry here. And now the echo uh, showing a slightly impaired LV function, nothing uh, to take seriously. You see the aortic valve anatomy. You already see this is a type zero with two sinuses. Uh, the valve opening area is less than one centimeter square. Uh, also, it is a kind of a, a product of low flow. And now the CT scan, if you have a look on the analyst, this is 600 uh, uh, square millimeter. So this is in the Sapien 329 range. Again, you can see the virtual reconstruction, again, confirming that this is a clear type zero and nothing to worry about the coronary takeoff heights as they're quite comfortable. Now we um, move on uh, to the, uh, uh, sorry, to the femoral uh, axis, which is basically, again, very comfortable here. And now the configuration uh, in regard to the sizing. And this is something that we, I think we need to spend uh, a couple of seconds here. So in a tricuspid, you only, only would assess the annular and potentially even the LVOT measurements. In the bicuspid uh, patient cohorts, it is uh, absolutely important to also assess the supraannular dimension. 
And so based on CVAS, again, it's a type zero. Based on the Babbitt registry or the Babbitt classification, uh, there is a tube, a flare, and a tapered configuration. And what we are facing here is a patient that has a, a, a smaller diameter supraannular. So uh, the intercommercial distance is only 25, whereas at the annular level, it's uh, almost 29. So this is a tapered configuration, which plays an important role in the optimal sizing. And again, based on the Ewan Makar classification, this is not a dangerous landing zone. It's kind of in a, a yellow zone because it is a type zero, it is uh, tapered, but it's not excessively calcified. Now, there are many ways on how to assess the supraannular uh, dimensions. And what we uh, have uh, suggested recently is the so-called circle method. So how this is done, you have uh, two circles here. Red is representing the 26 and blue is the 29. A virtual sapien implant, and then you do uh, increments of three millimeter from the annulus up to 15 millimeter above the annular plane. And what you are looking for is some dangerous zones where you could almost graphically see that the valve uh, could rupture the root, which is not the case here. And also, if you are in doubt between the larger and the smaller valve, it's also worth uh, having a look of whether or not the smaller valve in these bicuspid anatomies might seal in the supraannular level. So typically this is going to occur at either three or six millimeter. However, at this specific case here, we had the feeling that the smaller valve, so the 26 is not going to do the trick. And also there's not a high risk of root rupture. This is why we decided to go for the 29. So based on the annular sizing recommendation, this case, but this might change in another setting where you might have uh, even a more tapered configuration or more calcifications. Now, the typical uh, uh, caveats of a bicuspid implant, especially in a bicuspid type zero, is that it's very hard to achieve coplanar view. One potential bailout might be uh, using a second pigtail. A balloon valvuloplasty, uh, we use quite liberally in those patients that are heavily calcified, also can be used as a balloon sizing, was not required in this case here. We have discussed the valve sizing, uh, so you should really uh, uh, question yourself whether or not the smaller valve would also be a good option because it would avoid rupture and also it would uh, lead to a more circular stand expansion, especially in calcified people and also would avoid the so-called uh, pinwheeling phenomenon. Uh, but this is not going to be expected in this case here. And for the actual valve positioning, it's uh, critical to understand that uh, by embracing the super annular ceiling concept, you have to expect uh, the valves uh, anchoring earlier than in tricuspid. So this is why it's super important to aim initially very high. So this is the implant. Uh, so this is uh, a hopefully quite good uh, co-planar view. Other than that, it's a standard uh, conscious sedation uh, transfermal case. So this is the crossing, which wasn't too difficult here because we knew that the, uh, uh, there's no excessive calcification. Otherwise, we would have considered using pre-dilatation here. So as mentioned, it is super important in bicuspid anatomies to position the valve uh, uh, relatively high. So you can also use the translucent line here and align this one with the annulus. So the aim is to have a final implant that is at least 90-10, if not 95-5, to have a supraannular ceiling and also to avoid uh, conduction uh, abnormalities. And this only can be achieved if you start very high because you have to expect very early anchoring. So this is the uh, result here. There's no power valve leak, only slight crowning of the valve stand indicating that the valve size was correctly chosen. There's no residual pressure gradient, uh, gradient as usual. Also no AV block and a P-mean of uh, six millimeter of mercury by a transthoracic echo before discharge. Now let's have the uh, debriefing slide here. Uh, again, we use the circle method, so supraannular uh, valve sizing has been taken into consideration. We felt safe to go for the uh, larger valve here. We aimed very high because we did expect early anchoring. This is the uh, postoperative uh, 4D CT scan that we like to do in bicuspid anatomy to rule out elliptical stand expansion. You can see a nicely circular expansion here and also no sign of early valve thrombosis, neither conduction abnormalities. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Jörg. That was a great case and some really key concepts. We're a couple of minutes behind, but we should catch up um, as we run through the cases and the discussions. You showed the circles method um, for supraannular sizing. Um, can you just talk us exactly through, so you put these circles in 
for the 26 valve and the 29 in this case, at different levels, 3, 6, 9, 12 millimeters and at the annulus. Can you tell uh, the audience exactly what you're looking at with those circles and what would guide you? Yeah, obviously. Sizing? Maybe if we can have the slides uh, uh, up again, so you can uh, go back to this kind of uh, slide. And can, it's better to, to see, so it's easier to explain. So in other words, what you will do is, what we know is that in some anatomies, especially in calcified by cuspid anatomies, the supra uh, uh space might be the so-called bottleneck here. So we all know the concept of the annular sizing. It's for the safety and it's uh, based on the effective uh, uh, area. And now if you have a look here on these circles, so the idea is that above the annulus, the, the anatomy might be significantly smaller. So what we have to expect or take into consideration is that the valve might actually anchor and seal predominantly above the annulus. And this is why supra annular sizing is important. It has been uh, suggested to use the so-called intercommercial distance, which is also a good technique. However, it's only one kind of dimension. And this is why this graphical illustration, so kind of a simulation of the valve that you plan to implant uh, will uh, give you a guide. So if you have a look, let's say here on the three millimeter plane, and you have a look on the red circle, which would represent a smaller valve, it's, it's, it's almost touching the two commissures, but not perfectly uh, kind of uh, 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 getting to the edge of this, uh, of this anatomy here. And this is why we thought that in this case, the smaller valve might not seal, but you might see tomorrow a different case where the red circle would kind of extend to the commissures and then it would be smart to go for the smaller valve to avoid under expansion and root ruptures. This is basically the concept. Yeah, it's very clear. So the circle will tell you if you're going to get contact with the commissures and therefore anchoring and sealing. And also, I guess, you know, with the bigger size, you're looking to make sure that bigger size isn't extending outside the anatomy, particularly where there's heavy calcification. And that might put you at risk of complications, including annular rupture. So it'll tell us about anchoring and sealing the circle, but also whether it, a, a given size is too big and might put the patient at risk of complications. Radislav, do you have questions from the audience? I have a few other things I want to ask, but uh, so we have questions we want to answer. No, those. I don't have any anymore. I would like just to, to command that I'm taken aback by the systematic way to approach this patient by Professor Yerk, because it is the systematic C, uh, CT screening, the evaluation of the calcium burden, the evaluation of the RAFI, uh, whether, it, whether there are streaks of calcium going down to the LVUT, and also by the systematic analysis of the gradients, even uh, of the gradients doing uh, periprocedurally, uh, I think this is what, uh, what allowed uh, this outcome, and I would like to con con congratulate on this. I, com I completely agree, and I think it's a good opportunity to move forward to your case, Radoslav, because I know for a, uh, for a fact that it's going to be just as... Uh, as robust the approach to it, and it'll show the same concepts of sizing and, and positioning and deployment. So, so let's have uh, uh, Radislav Palmer then to show us a, another case, slightly different uh, anatomy, but similar principles for guiding treatment of bicuspids with Sapien 3. So Radislav, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to tell you a story of a patient which was successfully treated uh, not only by the proper CT screening, sizing, by the best device, but by the talks and many meetings of the heart team, which allowed to, to treat a patient which was outside the limits of uh, the current prosthesis in theory. But if I can you know, show you, this will be a talk about Tavi in a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve type 1, but a large aortic annulus exceeding the 683 millimeters, which is the highest uh, range for the tricuspid anatomy. So the patient appeared in Katowice in Poland uh, in an emergency state. He was a 76-year-old gentleman with a, com uh, with a decompensated heart failure, uh, New York uh, Heart Association class 4, and severe aortic stenosis with an ejection fraction on 20%, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with a Aortic aneurysm, previously diagnosed, hydrothorax, 
uh, which, was, which was bilateral and required immediate treatment. And also he, uh, he had unge un undergone uh, previous surgery and chemotherapy for colon cancer. Uh, they, all these comorbidities set them very high on the STS score at uh, 29%. So we also evaluated the echocardiography imaging. Uh, this was confirmed with a calcified RAFI. Uh, here you can see that the maximal gradient with such low ejection fraction was 34. There was also um, a moderate aortic regurgitation. The indexed area of the aortic valve was 0 0.6, and the patient had pulmonary hypertension of 63. So after stabilization of uh, these of this patient with diuretics with a puncture of both uh, both lungs, so we did the coronary angiography. We saw uh, significant calcifications of the aortic valve, but insignificant lesions in the proximal LAD, and also non non significant um, lesions in the in the RCA. Because of the prolonged hospitalization. As you can see also, we performed, we decided to perform a valvuloplasty in order to increase uh, the ejection fraction in this patient who could not have been uh, treated at that time surgically. He was waiting for another talk within our heart team. So it was 23 device, which was based on the echo. And um, we did not decide to put contrast in this patient because of the renal failure at the time. Uh, we saw that no waste, so we predicted that the, uh, that the aortic uh, annulus may be uh, much larger than that. And then we went on to, when the patient improved in the ward, we did the CT imaging uh, of the aortic complex. What we saw was a confirmation of bicuspidity you see uh, uh, on the one o'clock or two o'clock uh, uh, position, uh, calcified RAFI, which, is, uh, which confirms the uh, type one, uh, type one bicuspid aortic valve. We also saw that the height of the left main uh, was more than 12 millimeters, but the patient had a significant calcification of the, of the aortic valve complex. So what we, um, what we just uh, what we also did was to assess if the access to treat this patient is favorable for TAVI. Here you can see that with a um, previous diagnosis of the uh, abdominal aneurysm, uh, it was it was shown that uh, the thrombi inside this aneurysm are not uh, occluding the, the lumen, and this lumen is passable uh, with a with a TAVI system. We also classified this bicuspid uh, anatomy for, for planning for future possible TAVI intervention, as was uh, shown previously by Professor Kempfert, and it was Severs type one uh, with a left-right fusion. It was uh, it is one of the three classifications we know for assessing the risk of the patients. The Bava registry, uh, which is conducted by um, Professor DDHH from Toulouse, uh, assessed that um, this classification has put this patient on the either tube or, or small taper in the geometry with a wide annulus of 31 millimeter and the intercommissural distance was 30 millimeters. And the classification of uh, uh, a previously mentioned of Makar and Yurn uh, set this patient on the highest risk uh, of classification with a heavily calcified aortic complex and also with a calcified RAFI. So what were our considerations? We met three times uh, to treat this patient. First, we knew that this is somehow classical for, for bicuspid anatomy because it is the bicuspid anatomy which has the largest aortic roots and much larger than the tricuspid anatomies. So we may expect more patients with large anatomies in the future. Second, we were discussing uh, the outcomes in large anatomies in bicuspid anatomy treated with a sapien-3. And what I have already shown in the previous lecture was that in such large anatomies, we may expect more paravavial leaks uh, with self-expandable devices. Uh, and the sapien-3 might have given us less chance of paravavial leak. But still, of course, we were discussing whether this implantation would be safe uh, because we could not uh, reposition the device. But then we were also mm, showing the 
um, the experience of uh, uh, other European centers, which in which it was evidence that it is possible to treat a specific uh, sets of patients, even exceeding 1,000 millimeters square of the aortic root area, uh, if the classific if the bicuspid anatomy is present, because it will seal the valve, and uh, and this is what we followed. We also were discussing on whether to use a nominal inflation uh, volume or how much we can expand this valve, this valve. And we thought that we will, uh, here you can see the chart on the uh, top right corner. And we decided to maintain the, uh, the inflation of plus three millimeters, milliliters, but we had five millimeters margin in case we see that the contrast will leak during the inflation. And I would like just to go back for, for a while on the circle method because it is also used in our center. And the beauty of this method is that it is free of a specific uh, software. So on the right top, uh, right, right uh, bottom uh, corner, you can see that the three-dimensional software allows uh, to see how the S329 uh, prosthesis fits this anatomy, but the circle method is free from, from any dedicated software, and you can see every three millimeters, millimeters uh, that the 29 device should seal this anatomy on the intercommissural level. So we were just considering the circle method and also the sizes uh, and the inflation rates before treating this patient. So the recommendations which we uh, we were setting between us, uh, as we always do, the TAVI together with cardiac surgeons, were that we have to take time for valve crossing. We may bend the tip of the wire by 30 degrees uh, just to facilitate, facilitate the crossing. Also, probably considering hydrophilic wire. The balloon valveoplasty, we try to skip that, and we usually skip it also in bicuspid anatomy, if not, uh, if not required for the valve passage especially that we already performed the valveoplasty before. Uh, the valve position was supraannular sealing. Uh, we, as was, uh, was as shown before, but uh, by the group from Berlin, we usually try to set the marker at least one width of the marker higher than the line of the aortic valve in order to target the intercommissural uh, annulus. And this is actually the, the, the procedure we had a bit of a problem with crossing the valve. The wire also did not uh, go through. So we, we used a trick of using a five French uh, pigtail. We exchanged the pigtail for a smaller one in order to, to cross this heavily calcified valve. And also we predilated a bit the, the end of the balloon uh, just to facilitate the crossing of the valve, but we skipped the aortic valveoplasty. Also we placed the, the, the valve higher with a, with a marker which was one size higher than the aortic anatomy. And here you can see that the, uh, I would try to just to run it. Yeah, right, like here. You can see that the inflation was quite slow. It was a left ventricular pacing, but uh, we, we also skipped the, the, uh, the injection of the contrast. But you can see that we were set not to rush, just a small, just a slow, stable inflation. And we expected the under expansion on the, of the valve from the left, left coronary sinus, as you can see on the final implant. The, the final angiography proved that there is no leakage uh, through this valve and there was a full sealing and good position of the valve. So the, the takeaway was that, we, that the patient was treated with no aortic regurgitation and the low, low, uh, per, and the low gradient uh, after this implantation, and the follow-up with this patient is that the patient was discharged on day 14 from our center, and uh, it's been already five months of the follow-up, which are successful for this patient. So I would like to ask you about your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Radislav. A beautiful case, and I think you know time is short actually, but uh, we have one question that's come in. Uh, from the audience. I mean, I think that is a beautiful demonstration of how you can treat patients with anatomy that seems to be too big for, a, for, for a, even the 29 Sapien 3. And you really elegantly showed how the circles method, as we heard from Professor Kempford, it clearly showed that your 29 millimeter circles were making contact 
with the commerce years at three millimeters and at six millimeters. So giving you that confidence, you can, you're going to seal an anchor with a 29 and um, at what level you're going to seal an anchor and therefore anchor and therefore what level to aim for your implant. Question we've got from the audience just briefly is on balloon valvular plasty. When would you use it in bicuspids? Um, I'm going to ask Bruno that, but I'll just give one comment myself first, which is that one thing the balloon valvular plasty can do and could do in a case like this, where you are undersizing in inverted commas, you know, a 29 valve going into an annulus that measures 31, is give you that confidence. So a, a pre-dill, perhaps in this case with a 28 balloon, would show that with the balloon inflated and a simultaneous aortogram, there's a waste on the balloon and no paravalvular leak. Therefore, you'd expect the same when the valve goes in. Bruno, your practice in terms of balloon valvuloplasty in bicuspid anatomy with sapien? Yes, thank you, Dan. Uh, you know, the question is when to use uh, balloon valvuloplasty before predilation with balloon valvuloplasty, specifically in, in uh, bicuspid valves. There is there are two there are two options uh, there are two um, two uh, let's say two um, two matters two two issues one is if as you said if you doubt on the size of the 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 sapien tree to use and you can skip from one size to the other depending on the waist that you see during the balloon valvuloplasty. You don't need to perform a very let's say a very aggressive balloon valvuloplasty just to see the waist and to measure the waist. It can be done even without the aortic angiography because the way you can measure the waist. And the other one is, you know, sometimes the, the entrance to the ventricle is very eccentric. And even with the steep wire won't, won't be on the out in the external curve. So the direct TAVI can be, sometimes can be very, very uh, challenging. And sometimes even with the bigger valve, the 29 Sapien 3, can be even impossible to cross a bicuspid valve because of the fusion of the commissures. I will show it in the, or in, in my case, uh, the, the position of the Steve wire, guide wire. That's great. And you perfectly segued into your case. So um, to make sure we get through that, because I know it's a very challenging case, uh, we'll move straight on. Bruno, if you can uh, take control and we'll uh, see your case and we should have a few minutes for a final panel discussion at the end. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Okay, this is. Uh, I'm very sorry that I could not I could not um, prepare our case very, let's say, very uh, detailed as the Professor Kempford and Brothers Love presented it. But uh, this is a type one severe calcification and a Rafi case, so it's a highly risk case, and we had to look for, let's say, an an old case which was an 83-year-old uh, male. It was an inoperable patient because of um, most of uh, morbidities, but uh, now it would be a clearly not operable uh, patient. And as you can see in the on the CT scan, there is a clear uh, fusion of Rafe in the between the left and right coronary cusp, but there is a massive calcium, a, a very high burden of calcium on the non-coronary cusp, that you can see on the on the CT scan on the left, but also in the picture, in the picture screen on the right, and it's interesting because depending on where the massive calcium is or how the RAF is calcified, you know the risk of rupture of uh, the aortic root can lead to different uh, complications. So this was the the measurement. Sorry that I cannot show you the circle method that I. I assume it's a, it's a perfect method as Professor Kempfert and Brothers Love showed us very well, very smartly. But here you can see this is the measurement done and at the LVOT level, uh, where we normally use for the tricuspid patients. And here there is another, let's say, another uh, risk, uh, um, risk issue is that there is calcium coming from the in, uh, valve to the LVOT. That we, we know that uh, this leads to paravalvular leak uh, result. This is uh, the high of uh, both uh, coronary ostia. That uh, you know the picture is more interesting that to see the the high of the coronary ostia is to show you how the right, uh, the calcification, the massive calcification, it's clearly uh, uh, let's say it's stuck. It's clearly um, putting beside uh, cardiac structures. And that depending on where are they, 
when we uh, assume that the, the, the inflation of the valve will be done, then we can break these structures beside. Okay, this is the case, and this is where the, the, the tip that I was showing to you. Okay, you see that the angio is clearly a very big uh, annulus, a very big aorta. And as you can see on the left, there is the guide wire, the stiff guide wire has gone to the external curve. That means that the commissure is still, let's say it's still practicable to do a direct tabby. If the, com if the guide wire st stays on the centering of the center of the valve, that means that the commissure is, could, be, could be not uh, still fush, uh, uh, fusionate. So it would be very difficult to, to, um, to undergo with a direct tabby. And that case is we normally perform the, the balloon valvuloplasty, the predilation. On the right side, you see the positioning as uh, Dr. Uh, Paramat sh uh, showed us or Dr. Kempfert. It's very difficult to, to stay on the planet of view. And as you see, there is uh, aortic insufficiency during the, the implantation, during the selection of the height of the valve. But we want it to be very high. That's very, what you will see it very clearly. Okay, so this is the implantation method. And you can see that the, the calcium is clearly high, clearly higher than, the, than in the tricuspid valve normally is set up. But you will see on the result on the right that very clearly the position of the, the Sapien 3 is clearly 95.5, as Professor Kempfer uh, told to us, with no leak, no paravalvular leak. And you see that the 29 Sapien 3 it stays small, as Professor Parma showed us, but there is no leakage, there is a perfect result. Obviously, there was no gradient, and this is the result of our patient. Sorry that we don't have any other, you know, any other, but apart from that, we have the, the CT scan, the follow-up CT scan, that we normally don't perform them, but in this case, we had it, so I take the advantage to have this case to, to show it to you. And here you see how, the implantation of the sapient three valve has broken the, let's say, the massive calcium, splitting the calcium in, 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 the, in the three commissures, let's say, but without breaking the structures uh, beside. And this was, you know, this was the message of our case, more than, you know, selecting the case and how it's selected, you know, the ability of, to perform the sapient three implantation directly in a very, let's say, very high and very extremely high risk uh, anatomy of a bicuspid patient. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bruno. That's a, that's a great case. I mean, so calcified that valve would strike fear into you, but you've got a perfect result um, using a systematic approach um, or, and, and, and that high implantation technique. And I think for me, what you showed with your positioning was the use of the calcium. You were almost using that calcium as your target landing zone uh, rather than the base of the uh, sinuses as we would in tricuspid valves. We've got one question I think time for before I move on to the wrap up. If you can answer this in 30 seconds, maybe uh, Radislav, cerebral embolic protection in, ta in bicuspid TAVI, does it influence your decision as to whether you use uh, cerebral protection? I think with the current rate of evidence, we may consider the cerebral protection in patients with bicuspid anatomies, especially in the younger ones which for uh, certain reasons cannot undergo cardiac, uh, cardiac surgery than for valve valve implantations. I think we need to have also as for bicuspid uh, uh, patients, more trials to have a strong evidence we should use them. That's great. And less than 30 seconds, thanks so much. Can we move on to the closing slides just, and I'll wrap up this uh, webinar. So, and next slide, I think, thanks very much. So, I mean, we've run through what is a complex um, and a fascinating subject with many unanswered questions uh, in a short period of time. We've discussed the indications, the evidence for Sapien 3, and I think particularly beneficial for the audience looking at procedural technique, thinking about when you'd use supraannular sizing, when there's calcification of the RAFI, when there's tapering using the Bavard approach and using that systematic classification system, showing how the circles method is the pre preferred way of assessing sizing, particularly when you're considering uh, as undersizing relative to the annulus. Positioning the valve, we're aiming more for 100, 0, 95, 5, rather than 80, 20, 90, 10, and the implantation technique, which was shown so elegantly. 
So I'd like to thank the panel for fantastic cases and presentations today. And I'd like to ask the audience to look out for the expert consensus publication on sapien bicuspid TAVI and to seek proctoring, which is available from Edwards for any cases of bicuspid anatomy in your institution. So thank you everyone and good evening to you all.